I'm Morgan Peck, my editor-in-chief of City and State, and this is Last Look. Today, our guest is Jerry Kremer. He's the former chair of the Assembly Ways and Means Committee and the author of Winning Albany, Untold Stories About the Famous and Not-So-Famous. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. So, Jerry, what, what possessed you to, to write this book? Well, it started out about three years ago when I was going through file cabinets full of photos. And I said, boy, I have some great photos here. I said, maybe I ought to put them in a book. <laughs> and then the second thing was uh, I attended a, a talk that Bill Clinton gave. Um, and he said, you know, everybody ought to write a book, whether it's 10 pages or 1,000 pages, because it's like a legacy for your family and your grandchildren, for them to better understand what you did during your lifetime and the things you were involved in. So it really was a combination of uh, recognizing, you know, some great, if you will, opportunities to project into my life and talk about people that I met, the advice they gave me, and candidly, the opportunity of leaving something for, for my family to read and understand, you know, the stresses and strains, you know, the, the high moments and the low moments, and maybe it's sort of a, a, a advice to them about things they should avoid or do. In addition to advice to your family, I mean, your book isn't just a memoir, but it's also a roadmap for people who are either elected officials or thinking about running for office. I mean, what, what exactly is the wisdom that you sought to, uh, to, to give to future generations? Well, anybody who aspires to any public office, whether it's library trustee or, you know, the United States Senate, uh, you've got to have a plan You've got to go about it methodically. It can't be too many people try to do something, you know, literally uh, with wild guesses. Um, and I think one of the things that I was trying to say is if you want to move your way into something that's meaningful at whatever level it is, plan for it, uh, create coalitions, create friendships, uh, figure out how to raise money, figure out how to make yourself relevant in a campaign. But it, this was meant to basically say, you know, you can do it, but there's potholes in the road, and there's also a lot of ways that you can succeed by advancing yourself, but you're not going to be an overnight success. Uh, you talk about, in, in your book, the importance of ha finding a mentor, a political mentor. Can you talk about who your political mentor was and, and why it, it's so essential if you want to have a career in politics? Well, first of all, mentors don't come to you, okay? If, if you want a mentor, you have to pick out the person who you have the best chemistry with, show them that you're worthy of their support, and then, you know, forge that relationship over a period of years. It's not going to come to you automatically. But, you know, if you start to build a relationship from the ground up with a potential mentor, if that person thinks you're qualified and is a good reflection of them, then they're going to embrace you. So, but it, it really does help if you have a mentor, regardless of the type of mentor that is. And you trace your ascent in, uh, through the assembly ranks to the the second, uh, you know, the the second highest ranking position in the chamber. How is it that uh, an, uh, a member of the legislature or a member of a city council can move up in the leadership? What's the secret? Well, the, 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 the test is not just worrying about whether you're going to get reelected, you know, two years later or as many years, but you really have to plan. You've got to learn how to uh, get good, positive public exposure. Uh, you've got, really got to spend a lot of time doing what we call retail campaigning. You've got to be willing to shake hands with everybody and anybody uh, from the bottom of the economic ladder to the top. You've got to try to spend some time developing ideas that are meaningful and that the public will embrace. Um, and you just have to try to be a little bit of a visionary in whatever thing you, know, you, you want to be part of. One of the most fascinating chapters in your book, I felt like, was uh, when you tell the story about how you ran for speaker against Mel Miller, who it seems that you have somewhat of a low opinion of. Um, do you, uh, you had an opportunity at one point to almost get into an IDC type situation, isn't right. that the case? Yeah, I mean, th the offer was made to me at a time when I probably had about 27 votes and you need 76. The offer was made to me of 52 Republican votes. If you want them, they're yours. 
And of course, number one, I was taken aback because the climate in Albany up to that point in time, in my lifetime, was always one, if you need a vote from the other side of the aisle, you're gonna have a hard time getting it. So, and even as a committee chairman, um, I used to have to go to my ranking member and say, you know, what is it that you need in some bill or something to get the extra votes that I needed? So um, it was very, very tempting. But I, I, my concern was I tried it out on a couple of people who were supporting me from upstate New York. And they said, well, you know, I don't know if I can really support you under those circumstances because you're going to take away from our side of the aisle. Uh, and, you know, and the more I thought about it is I just had the feeling that it would be impossible to govern. In hindsight, uh, it would have probably been a good arrangement because the minority was not going to ask to take over the house and you know and run the place. The minority is so used to getting just a few scraps of whatever it is that anything that improves their situation will be worth the vote. And in 1965, um, it was the Republican minority in the you know, in the state senate that made Joe Zaretsky the majority leader, and Anthony Travia, who became the speaker of the assembly also did it with Republican votes. And then once uh, Mel Miller became the speaker, he and the new leadership essentially squeezed you out of the body, right? I mean, you, uh, you won successfully won re-election and you left on your own accord, but they had taken away your committee chairmanship and really pushed you to the side. Well, the, 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 the lesson for me from that experience and for anybody, the takeaway is if you're on your path to something that's going to be a contest, don't drop out for the sake of party, you know, th that this is going to be for the good of the party, because that doesn't exist. There's no great party loyalty today, uh, it, no matter where you are, whether it's Washington or in Montauk Point. The answer is, if you're running for something, go all the way. Why stop and basically say, okay, this is the right thing to do? That was my mistake. I, actually, I thought that that party loyalty trope was just like spending more time with your family. I thought that's just something that politicians say to excuse tough uh, political decisions. Yeah, well, the, anybody who retires is doing so to see their family, even <laughs> if their family doesn't want to see them. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer becomes is, if you're going to go into a contested election of any kind, and whether it's your party or it's uh, the opposite party, the answer is go all the way. If you lose, you lose. But my, my principal regret was my support probably from what I was told was much deeper at the time than I anticipated and that I had a case to make. And, and at least, at the very least, I should have gone before my party conference, stated my case, and see where it went. So mistake and advice to anybody who's aspiring to somebody, if you're in it, you've got to go all the way. Um, now, through uh, New York area, you're still very engaged in Albany. How has the legislature changed since the, the time that you were in office? Well, I think the best way to encapsulate what this legislature is about and all of them currently is, in my day, it was about the next 10 years. Currently, it's about the next 10 minutes. The, the legislature, uh, all of them, whether it's Washington or here, everybody's worrying about survival and the next election. Will I get a primary contest? Who's going to run against me? And this vision stuff is out the window. I mean, occasionally they'll do something that has long-range implications, but I don't call that planning for the future. If you put programs into place that are going to make people's quality of life better, then okay, that's the kind of stuff you should be doing. But if you're doing something just because you want to close a gap in the budget, and in the end it's going to cost the state a lot more, then you haven't done the right thing. And what about Long Island politics? Uh, you were the head of the uh, assembly delegation from Long Island. Um, how is, I mean, of course, it used to be just a Republican stronghold, the strongest of strongholds. Um, how has the, how have the dynamics on Long Island politics changed? Well, first of all, in Nassau and Suffolk counties, uh, Democrats now outnumber Republicans, which was, you know, a, most people feel a positive development. But then the number of independents has grown uh, dramatically and they tipped the balance on Long Island, even though the people in each party thinks that they are the ones, you know, who are running the ship. If you don't attract the independent voters, uh, years ago those independent voters used to be, they'd come to Nassau County or Suffolk and register Republican so they'd get their streets plowed during a snowstorm or get a stop sign put in. That's, that's gone now. These growing number of independents are people who really don't feel any affinity to any party and are basically saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand on the side uh, 
and then make my decisions based on whatever criteria I use. But the, the island has changed. Many years ago, the first person who campaigned on Long Island for president was Dwight Eisenhower. Richard Nixon came to Long Island three times because of the strength of the Republican organization. That doesn't happen anymore. There's no independent person who, you know, who's going to come to Long Island who the public's going to embrace. But the independents are really controlling the way Long Island goes. Do you think that that creates an opportunity for a, a third party, or is it that independent dynamic is just going to be like a shifting of seas between the Democratic and the Republican parties? I think whether it's nationally or locally, there's more, uh, more of an openness on the part of the public to a, a third party candidate. They're worn out from the Democrats and they're worn out from the Republicans. And my sense is if the right person came along and the right group came along who had the finances to, to run the races, that they'd have a good chance. It, it wasn't ripe four years ago, it wasn't ripe two years ago, but you can sense on the part of the public that they've really had it up to here. Hey, and you are a former Democratic boss, but you said it was the worst job that you ever had and you left it as quickly as possible. What is it that you didn't like about being a Democratic leader? Well, first of all, two hats I don't believe will ever fit. When you're an elected official, you have the ability to be above the fray. Once you become a party person, you're now responsible for everything going on everywhere, even if you had nothing to do with it. So party bosses really take a tremendous hit to their credibility because, and that rubs off on them as a, as a person in office. So the answer is, in some jurisdictions, some parties, the idea of wearing two hats, it's really not a problem. But by and large, my recommendation is, if you have an opportunity to be a party leader, don't do it. You started your career as a journalist, you're still a columnist, and you're also a longtime commentator for News 12 on Long Island. Um, were there any surprises for you in this uh, last election cycle uh, in, in regard to Long Island politics? I, I think, first of all, most people expected that there might be some fallout from all the troubles in Washington, that the Republican brand was tarnished, uh, that the Democrats maybe would have some kind of edge. Um, and I expected that the Democrats might make some inroads in places where historically they haven't. That didn't happen. All the incumbents who were there, Republican or Democrat, nobody was mad at them. Uh, I would say to you that if you're running next year, you know, beware of the public. Because I think next year, based on everything that's happened in Washington, they may be prepared to take it out on the incumbents. Uh, and they have a completely different approach to the next election. This election, off year, incumbents survived, no surprise. And lastly, you're one of the leading lobbyists who deals with energy issues in, in Albany and New York State. Um, what are uh, the, the principal uh, energy concerns that you're going to have going into the 2014 session? Well, uh, my, my concept about the legislature is they're always playing defense when it comes to energy. They will, you know, we're against this and we're against that. We'll introduce some bill, you know, which will in a modest way help like solar advance. But the legislature has failed to play offense. You don't get anybody in Chicago sitting on a pot of money being willing to invest in New York when they see that in New York there are people against hydrofracking, against wind, against nuclear, against LNG facilities. There's th this, this groundswell on the part of the antis uh, has really set back the energy industry by 100 years in this state. And what I would hope that the legislature uh, will take a step, step back and see what's going on and basically say, if we want there to be energy supplies, we've got to do this or we've got to do that. If you believe in solar, fine. Then pass bills to provide legitimate incentives. You believe in, in liquid natural gas, okay, you think it could be used. Don't beat it down because you think it's related to hydrofracking. Do something for, for, you know, the whole rest of the country is making us energy independent. And New York's special interests are making us energy dependent again and again. Well, former Assemblyman Jerry Kremer's book is Winning Albany. It's a fascinating read. I encourage everyone who follows the legislature to give it a look. Jerry, thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. And that's it for this episode of Last Look. Please join us on the web for more episodes at cityandstateny.com.